you have been very patient to sit for all these meetings. It's a long time to digest things like this. What we're going to do now, it's about 5.30, so we have some time. I will leave it completely up to you now. Around 6 o'clock or so, we have a little break for a light supper before the last meeting at 7 o'clock. And as I said, you can kind of let your minds just kind of relax a little bit for that meeting. It will not be something to wrestle your minds around like we've done this afternoon. So I'm going to let you decide how much time you want to spend. If some of you have to leave or be able to do other things right now, yeah, and you, I thank you for, for coming and for being part of our group. If some of you want to stay, I'll stay until around 6 o'clock as, as long as you want to ask a question, make a comment, give a thought. The time is now 100% yours. And you can decide what you want to do with the next half an hour. All right. Is there anyone that wants to make a comment or ask a question about anything? I'm not restricted. Yes. I'd like to just read something. Please, please. That goes right along with what the last ten minutes of okay. which, what you've said. All true obedience comes from the heart. Mm -hmm. It was heart work with Christ. And if we cons consent, he yeah. will so oh, identify wow. himself with our thoughts and aims, so bind our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. Yes, the will refined and sanctified will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience through an appreciation of the character of Christ through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. Isn't that a marvelous statement? Give us the reference. Give us our reference here. I, when I copied you it, didn't copy the reference. Um, I didn't get the reference on here. But if somebody has a it's computer, our page is the what? Is our page is okay, that's there we go. It. Thank you very much. Yes. So what's our page is six sixty eight. Yes. Okay, that's right. All right. So at this point, what we just heard is that this is the explanation, as best I can tell of the text I started with Philippians 2 5 to have the mind of Christ because we have the mind of Christ we will have the same attitude toward obedience and disobedience as he had and what a miracle it will be if sin will become as hateful to us as it was for Christ we are talking about a miracle and we're talking about God's greatest miracle way bigger than raising Lazarus from the dead way bigger than that because raising Lazarus all they had to do was put back together blood vessels and and what muscles and tendons and things going again in the brain. He has to change our whole thought processes while we're still living up here. While we're still messing around up here in this mind. He has to change our whole, our whole brain. That is a miracle. Thank you for sharing that. Appreciate that. Who else wants to offer a thought, question, anything? Yes. I'd like to hear your thoughts. I found a little bit on the school of Christ. His character is not given and learned. Say the first book. What is Christ? School of Christ. School of Okay. That is, let's say that character is earned, earned not, not given. given. Okay, all right. Uh, you know what? Uh, nature is given. Nature is given. You get a nature. That's what this was all about. You get a nature at birth. You get another nature at the second coming. That's a gift. Character is not a gift. It's a miracle in which there is divine cooperation. You Get the mind on eternal things. God purifies the thoughts and you live an obedient life. So that's what she's saying about earning. That we have to make the decision. We don't achieve it. We receive, the word receiving isn't good either. We participate in this character work. So it's a divine human cooperation that this is talking about character surrender leading to character maturity. That's what I understand about the school of Christ. Okay? All right. Yes? Now, in the 144,000, he writes that in number? Yes. But you hear people talking, well, it's symbolic. Yes. Could it be possibly in number and symbolic? Okay, we got a question here. Uh, she says the 144,000 in number, I think it's early writings, page 15 or so. And so then we have, we have the debate goes on as to which it is. Here's what I'm going to do this afternoon, because I know you have thought about this, will think about it, will discuss it, and this is, this is an ongoing topic, because it's so important. I'm going to give you three options 
for what this is all about. And you have to think through, study through what you think is the proper biblical understanding of that. The first option is that, is this is the more traditional Adventist view, is that the 144,000 are either a literal or a symbolic number, but usually symbolic. And I'll tell you why the idea is symbolic. Because in Revelation 7, it says that there were 144,000, 12,000 out of each tribe. Right? So where are you going to get tribes? And 12,000 out of each tribe. And so we've speculated they mean character traits. Probably right. But still, that's symbolic. That's not literal tribes. And so you read through that, and it all seems to be in a symbolic form in that passage as you read through. And that's where the symbolic idea comes from. Okay. So the first view is that the 144,000, and some say literal and some say it's symbolic, but they will be the only ones who go through the close of probation. Right? Some say literal, some say symbolic, but the idea is only they go through this period after Jesus Christ closes his work in the heavenly sanctuary. While the great multitude are all those raised from the dead throughout the ages of Christ's on the, of, of time on this earth. The, hundred, the uh, first fruits were the ones raised in Christ's resurrection. The full fruits and the great multitude are those who are raised from the dead at the second coming of Christ. So in this view, the more traditional Adventist view, the 144,000, usually considered symbolic but sometimes literal, are the ones who go through the close of probation, the great multitude raised from all time. The second view, which has come to view in a few Adventist thinkers of the past century a little more now than that was before. It goes like this. The 144,000 are definitely literal. Definitely literal. They are the ones drawn primarily out of this movement of Adventist truth. Not necessarily just Seventh-day Adventist, but Adventist truth of the understanding that we have of the great controversy, the seal of God, all of the things I've been explaining. They are the ones who have understood and taken this and become ready for the final outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. Then under the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain, primarily upon this 144,000 group, which is literal, then they will go out to the entire world in the final loud tribe work of witnessing to the world, convert the great multitude out of every nation, kindred, tribe, and people. And those who are willing to respond to this final call message will come in and join the ranks of this final generation together. And both the literal 144,000 and the great multitude of those who are converted under their preaching will go through the final events of the close of probation, through the seven last plagues, and through the final events of Earth's history. That is the second view. The third view is based on the scenario in Revelation 7, where, first of all, John hears, notice that carefully, John hears the number of the 144,000. And then all of a sudden the angel turns it around and he sees the great multitude. And the idea there is that the first is the audio version and the second is the video version of the same group. One is called 144,000 because it's the number of perfection. But it's really a symbolic number of the whole great multitude who are going to be sealed by God's seal and go through the close of probation. So it is the one and the same talked about in different terms. 144,000 in these verses, great multitude in these verses. One audio, one video. That few people have been subscribing to in the last 20, 30 years or so. So there you have three options, folks, of trying to figure out what this great multitude, 144,000 combination is. The more traditional, older Adventist view, the more recent but not brand new idea that, uh, that it is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain that brings the great multitude in, and the third, that they are one and the same group, therefore it has to be a symbolic number. Those are the options, brother. I got a question. Last part of the Desire of Ages, when Christ is in heaven, it says, I present the way of sheep. Yes, the way of sheep. The ones resurrected with him. That's right. As, as the first fruits of the great multitude yes. shall be raised. Yes. 
So with that statement, in my mind, that the first is more logical. Well, it nullifies the last part of the second one mm -hmm. and the third one. Yeah, so the first one would be more logical in that understanding. The only question left is, is the great multitude she's referring to there the same as the great multitude that is referred to in Revelation 7? But the logic is there. They could be both the same talk group that is talked about, which would favor option number one. What's your option? Oh, it's my option. I knew you'd ask me. <laughs> and I usually answer questions, but this time, I'm copying out. <laughs> What I do, what I do in seminars that I present, is I present convictions that are deep in my heart, that if you challenge me on them, I'm going to argue pretty strongly because I think I have some evidence to back me up. I'm going to push my views strongly, and even some people say dogmatically, because I am so convinced that the evidence is rock solid. Now, I might be wrong, but I present those convictions. I have opinions as well. I really really don't share opinions. Because my opinion of one week might be the opposite next week. And in fact, I've changed my mind on this once or twice during the past 20 years. And I'm not sure where I'm going to end up in the future. So I'm not going to share my opinion with you because my opinion is worth no more, no more than five cents in a wooden nickel. And so opinions are irrelevant to our study. So I'm going to encourage each one of you to study the subject. Form your own opinion. Give your best study to it. Give a good judgment. You have thought something out and you feel com more comfortable with one, but leave your mind open to the possibility that not all yet has been revealed to us. And even Ellen White says something that even strange in my ears. She says, we, not all yet has been revealed about the mark of the beast. I thought I knew about the mark of the beast. Of all things, I, know, I thought that. But not, we don't know everything yet, she says, about the mark of the beast. So on some subjects where God has not crystallized his answer, we must have something in at least abeyance. This is our opinion at this time, and that's why I don't share opinions, because they're too fragile. <laughs> yes? Can you say it's not a salvation issue? And it's not a salvation issue. It's one of those that everybody calls a salvation issue, and not, a, but is, and this is not, this is one of the true not a salvation issue. Yep? I just found it extremely disturbing to find out that Satan is allowed to continue to hurt us, our children, and God until we get this message right, until we understand the true knowledge. It just is I know. heartbreaking. I know. But let's go back to Israel in the Old Testament times. God is ready to take them through to the promised land using no force, no spears, no, no swords, by hornets driving out the people out of the land so that they could take over the land as peacefully as possible and enjoy the fruits and everything that was there. And because of the fact that they couldn't obey him, couldn't get it through their heads, we have to do it our way. God had to take them out 40 years of complaining and sick, and not sickness, they weren't sick, but of, of, of struggle and everyone dying off in the process. And then before they get to the promised land, the, they, they fall prey to another deception of Satan through Balaam, and half of them get destroyed practically on the borders of the promised land for their apostasy, and just all kinds of terrible things happening because of free choice. Oh, that's the tough one. Yes. Some people say God is responsible for all the evil that has happened on this world because he lets Satan run, his, run havoc on this world. And I agree, God is responsible because he allows free choice. If he had taken away free choice, there would have been none of this on this planet. But boy, I wouldn't want to live here either. No. Yeah. If free choice is gone, and I'm a robot and a computer and an automaton, uh, I have no desire to be part of that creation of God. So with, this, with God giving us free choice, he has given the permission for anyone, Adam first, and then any one of us, to believe Satan over him. And until it is absolutely proved that all of Satan's accusations are lies, he has to let it go. He does not have any other option because if he did cut it short, if he said, I'm tired of what Satan is doing, I'm just going to stop it, I guarantee sin would happen again in God's universe somewhere. A question would be raised that hadn't been answered yet, and someone would fall for it. Every question about God's character, about God's goodness, about God's fairness, about His love and His justice and His mercy has to be answered before this universe gets secure again. 
And that's why it's so painfully and awfully long in the process. And so many innocent people get wiped out in that process as well. I agree with you. I struggle with it. Yes? I have a question about the nature of Christ. And I was reading on your website about human nature and was startled by three quotations mm -hmm. that you have there. Um, it says, as related to the first Adam, mm -hmm. man receives yes. from him nothing but guilt yep. and the second death. And the sentence of death. Or the se sentence of death. Yes. Is. And then also it says, fallen human beings were heirs of guilt under sentence of eternal death. And yes. The is, These dear children receive from Adam an inheritance of disobedience, of guilt, and death. Yeah, you saw that on my website, didn't you? Yes. The one that I've been preaching all day that that isn't true. And you read it on my website. No, no. What, yes, what you I'm, did. What I'm trying to figure out <laughs> is, um, okay, so, and you say here, these statements are quite clear. Those who are born into this sinful uh, world receive from Adam guilt, sin, separation, and eternal death. Yeah. And so then the answer that you give to that is that Jesus... Mm -hmm took that guilt from all men, mm -hmm. everybody that was ever born. Mm -hmm. But the but what I'm struggling with is, okay, but if Jesus took our nature, mm -hmm. which is an inheritance from Adam, mm -hmm. he is also guilty because we are guilty. Okay, let me try to explain that because I didn't explain that in that article. The article, if you want to read it in its full, is are all men, uh, are, are all men condemned at birth? That's the article title. Here's what I see in that whole situation. There are problem texts in the Bible. I didn't talk about them today. I just talked about the positive texts. Did not David say that I was born in sin, in iniquity, did my mother conceive me? Does not Paul say we are all children of wrath by nature? Ephesians that's, chapter that's 2. Also here. That's all there. It's all in that article. Didn't Romans 5 say that we are all condemned because of one man, Adam? So there are some of these statements that lead people to believe that what I shared with you this morning is wrong, that we are sinners by choice. And then Ellen White comes along with the statements you just read, that all we receive from Adam is guilt and the sentence of death. And there are some more statements. So that's why a good number of Seventh-day Adventists do believe in original sin right now, that we're born sinners. And I try to deal with that. So here's what I'm going to offer, and then I'll get back to Jesus Christ. Adam has only one gift to offer us in his hand. It is sin and guilt and eternal death. That's all he's got to offer us as he sins. When he sins, that's the inheritance of the whole human race. That's your inheritance, yours, and mine. Nothing else can be inherited from Adam and guilt and eternal death. That's all he's got to offer. He's got no hope. He's got no help. He's got no good suggestions. It's all doom and gloom from his hand. And then because of the fact that Jesus Christ will not let the human race go that easily or that quickly, Jesus Christ comes out with another gift in his hand. And what he offers in his gift on that level, we're not talking here, now don't mistake, we're not talking about when I want to be saved, when I accept Jesus as my Savior, when I am forgiven my sins. We're not talking about those issues at all. That's justification by faith, which is an entirely separate subject. This is what happens when Adam sins and how Jesus Christ steps into the picture when Adam sins. And because of the fact that the whole human race is under final execution sentence, Jesus Christ removes the death sentence Jesus, from the race. Now we're talking about not individuals, eternal death. Jesus Christ takes the guilt. Jesus Christ takes whatever Adam offered, negates it, and offers to us a whole new package. Yes, you will suffer in childbirth. Yes, you will work by the sweat of your brow. Yes, you will go back to the dust but I'm offering you eternal life. That's what happens in this one-at-a-time universal act of God through Jesus Christ. It happened with Adam in the Garden of Eden. What Adam offered, all he could offer, guilt in the sense of death, is taken by Jesus Christ for the race. 
for the race. We're not talking here, as best I can tell, about individual guilt, which I suffer either by being born or by choosing. Not the issue at all. It is what Adam offers to the race, what Christ offers in response, how Christ removes that. So now we have Christ's offering. That's what I understand these texts to say. And so there is this debate over this, I will freely admit, but that's my best understanding. Now, how does this relate to Jesus Christ? When, when Jesus took that guilt away, that sentence of death away, he also removed the fact that inheritance means condemnation and guilt. Inheritance of equipment, nature, the body that Adam has is now a dying body. It'll last a while, 900 years, but it's a dying body. Mine just doesn't last that long. It's the same principle. The body Adam has is not an eternal body anymore. It can't live forever. It is a corrupt body. It is an evil body. And the nature that he has within him is an evil nature. It leads to sin. It pulls us away from Jesus Christ. But the very fact that Christ steps in and he alters the pattern so that guilt is not a necessary part of the human race means also that hereditary weaknesses are not guilt producing in any way. That guilt is not transferred by heredity as Adam would have transferred. In other words, all the statements are what Adam would have given, not did give, as best I can tell. And so all of these things are now negated by Christ so that human nature carries no guilt with it, even though it is imperfect, even though it is evil, it carries no guilt. And I'm going to offer you the suggestion that Christ carried with him an evil body for 33 years of his life. His cells, bodily cells, were dying too, just like mine do. If he would live to age 70, 80, 90, most likely he would have died because his body didn't have the vitality that Adam's body had. His was a corrupt body. His was a corrupt physical organism, uh, and destroyed by sinful results, not sinful guilt. And therefore his nature was part of that package that Christ had to take with him during his entire life. Neither nature nor body is guilt producing. Neither nature or body brings condemnation. And in a very real sense, I don't say this often because I'm really going out on a limb here, Christ's death had to pay in some way for the evil of the body that he had inherited. Because he has to remove that at the second coming. How does Christ have the right to give you a new body? Unless he had in some way paid for that at the cross of Calvary and thus paid for his own body that he had taken. That's a very, very, shall I say, esoteric argument that I don't use very often, but I thought in re response to your question, he did many things in the Garden of Eden, and he changed the whole scenario, and therefore he took bodily weakness, which is not sin, he took nature weakness, which is not sin, and because he didn't yield to the body or to his nature, he was pure and holy and sinless. I don't know if that helps. That's my try. When you were talking here a bit ago, you said, this lady back here said that we had free agency. And I don't really think that's, God give us agency, but I don't think he gave us free agency okay. because for every thing that we do, there's consequences yes. whether we do it right or wrong. So yes. to say free agency. All right, let's change the term. I don't know if you use the term free agency or not. I can't remember that. But the word free agency may not be the best term. Because free agency kind of means I am kind of free, in other words, to do whatever I want to do. Well, that might be true as long as you can keep your heart beating. Then you may have free agency. As long as you can't keep your heart beating, I don't think we have free agency. What we have is one slice of free agency, which is free choice. Our minds cannot be manipulated by Satan and God will not manipulate them. And so we have the ability to choose options. That's all we've got. We don't have, we never can choose our destiny. We can't make our own destiny. We can choose options to destiny, God or Satan. Those are our only choices. We can't choose life, we can't choose death, we choose options, God or Satan. And one of those options will lead us one way, one the other way. So all we have is free choice. And that's what some people never did believe either, like Martin Luther. But uh, I believe that we do have free choice. Now, I don't know if that's getting to what you wanted or not. Free choice, yes. 
free agency carries too much other baggage with it. Maybe. Yes. I, I was reading a, a, a book recently where they they argue that man really does not have free choice at all because God's law does not allow free choice. Mm. So mm -hmm. it, by giving by giving people the idea they have free choice, mm -hmm. you're telling them they can sin. Yeah. That, that's their argument. That yeah. The law says, no, you don't have free choice. God didn't create you with free choice. Yeah. Because if he did, he said, well, you can go ahead and sin. Yeah. But, you know, but he did say why, that. Why didn't yes. he show up at the, at the tree and grab Eve's hand? That's right. And say, don't you know what's going to happen? That's you right. Do what you're doing? That's he, right. There was silence. He, yeah. he had already given him the warning, but he didn't force her yeah. to not do what he knew would cause all the grief in the universe. Yeah. Free to me, that proves that you have, you have God. Values for each other. And up in heaven, I mean, the situation as Ellen White describes what happened in heaven before it came down to this earth. This was not a quick business. Lucifer began to have some questions. He asked God and Christ the questions. He wasn't satisfied with the answers. And he went around to the angels and talked up his, they're not giving me straight answer program. And he got some angels uh, thinking along his lines. And uh, then God held a great council of the angels. And he explained things that even the angels up to that point had not understood. And even one of them was that Christ is substantially different than Lucifer, even though they both act like they're doing the same thing. They're representing me to the unfallen worlds. And he said, Christ is the creator and Lucifer is the created. He had to explain that to the angels. And so here at this point, finally, when it's all laid out as to who's his, who, who do you believe? Christ or Lucifer? At this point, it still goes on. Lucifer almost changed his mind, she said. He was at the point of saying, you're right, God. I've gone down the wrong path. And immediately he could have stepped back into his position as commander of the hosts of heaven. He had not sinned yet. He had questions. He had uncertainties. He even wondered if God had told the angels all they needed to know. And God is saying, I'm going to give him every chance. I'm going to give him all the time he needs. We'll spread this out. And finally, when it became totally a rebellion, then Satan, Lucifer, had made his choice. Lucifer had given, been given total free choice. First to question without sin. Even to wonder without sin. And then finally, to rebel if necessary. Free choice is the only reality of this whole universe, folks, that makes any difference at all. If that isn't true, the whole Bible is false. Yeah. The books that are coming out are getting stranger and stranger. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think that partially that's continuing to happen in the movements that's coming out of this church. Mm -hmm. They're making a choice to stay with That's people. true. That's true. New light issues. Choosing to kind of separate from the brethren over new truth that I know and you don't know, and therefore you're going to be lost if you don't get with it. That's a choice. All choices, and God allows those choices to mess things up all over the place. Yes? Our son brought home a verse. It's out of the Old Testament. I forgot where it is, but God's saying, I did this, I did this. I created I create good and I create evil. Right. Yeah. And I looked up evil in the concordance, and it means evil. Uh -huh. Can you expound on that? All right. I hardened Pharaoh's heart. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a number of statements along that same line. Uh, there are two explanations for that, and I'll tell you which I believe is the most important uh, understanding. The word evil in the Hebrew language can also mean destructiveness, can also mean evil effects. And so uh, in this sense, you could say that the flood was an evil thing that happened to the world because it destroyed so many people. Uh, when, uh, when the angel killed, uh, what is it, 186,000 of Sennacherib's men, uh, in the army, uh, that was a destruction of life. And so God created an evil thing to produce a good result. <laughs> you know, you can almost say and justifies the means, but that's a whole other issue. I don't want to go there. The other option, which I favor, is that God is saying, and for the Hebrew mind, remember, they think a little differently than our Western logical Roman mind that we've inherited from Europe. The Hebrew mind says, whatever God allows, he ultimately causes, because he could have gone the other way. If he has allowed something to happen, then he is the ultimate cause of that in his allowance of that, because if he could have negated that by his own choice and not allowed it. So for the Hebrew mind, what God allows, he causes. And that's what I understand the text to mean. I create good and I allow evil. 
Uh, that would be the, the logical thinking of a Hebrew mind. And that's why Pharaoh would be in the same situation. I allowed Pharaoh to harden his heart. Therefore, he hardened Pharaoh's heart. For the Hebrew mind, the ultimate cause for all things is God. And I think I said to someone today, so I'll say it again. If you want to say God caused evil in this world, then you can say in the sense that he allowed free choice. He didn't have to allow free choice. So if he allows free choice and that brings about evil, then ultimately he's the cause of evil. But that gets really, I don't want to go too far down that road either because that doesn't get us anywhere. But what God allows, the Hebrew mind is comfortable with saying he causes. That's my understanding of the text. Yes? Well, I was just going to add to that. It says, I bring peace and I bring evil. Mm -hmm. Another word that could be used for that is uh, calamity. Calamity, so, that is another word. So when you, yeah. when you, when you play it off of peace, mm -hmm. it makes more sense. That's right. So that's the other option. That may be a better option. I don't know. I, I think the first. So. Yeah, the one young lady first and then I'll... Uh, oh, okay. Comment. Right there. I have a question. Okay. In Leviticus 4, it talks about sins that, like, offerings for unknown There sins. you go. And I was wondering, like, why is there offerings if there's no guilt? That's a good question. Did you hear that question? In Leviticus, there are offerings to be brought, sin offerings to be brought for sins of ignorance, unknown sins. How can you bring an offering if it's unknown and it isn't a sin? That's because I have said the sin of ignorance, remember my chart, belongs on the evil side, not on the guilt side, the sin of ignorance. If you're breaking the fourth commandment, it's a sin of ignorance, but not a sin of guilt. Okay, so you, you are listening very well. All right, here's the way it has to work. How could you put yourself in Israel's time? Put yourself in a camp of Israel, and you are an individual bringing a lamb as a sin offering to the Lord. When you come to the Lord, to the priest, you say, I am bringing this lamb as a sin, as an offering for a sin that I don't know if I've committed or not. I don't know if I've sinned, but I'm supposed to bring the lamb uh, just to be sure that I haven't committed an unknown sin. That wouldn't be too uh, convincing, I think, for the priest, because he'd want to know, what have you done? Did you steal from someone? Did you defraud another person? Did you break the Sabbath? Why are you bringing an offering? And you're saying, I'm bringing an offering because I must have committed some sin that I don't know about. Uh, even in the Catholic confessional, that wouldn't work too well. You know, when they say, I'm sorry for what I did this and this and this, and you said, I'm sorry because I must have committed a sin, the priest will say, well, what sin was that? So it doesn't work. Here's what really happened. If a particular thing was totally unknown by an individual, had no idea that it was wrong, no evidence had come to him, and he did something wrong, he had no idea that he was doing something wrong, therefore he would have no compunction of conscience to bring a sin off. He wouldn't know what to bring it for. But when someone, it might be a priest of that time, it might be uh, an individual, a neighbor of his, maybe a wife or a husband or even a son or a daughter. Might say, you know what you're doing? You've been doing it wrong all these years. For instance, you've taken, I'll just give you an example. You've taken property from your neighbor and you could always keep that property for 49 years and then you had to give it back to him. But you've kept it 60 years and you didn't give it back to him. You've broken the law of God. That was the law that you had property only for 49 years and then it went back to the owner who gave it or sold it to you. And if you kept it for 60 years, you hadn't figured out the dates right, and uh, all of a sudden someone says, but you've broken the law. Oh, all of a sudden, light has come. Light has dawned, and you bring a sin offering for the past sin that you committed that you had no idea of knowing that it was a sin until someone told you it was a sin. And then you said, Lord, I'm sorry for breaking your law unwittingly at that time, but now I know about it. And so it is when a person knows by someone else helping that person what is wrong and what he did was wrong, then they brought an offering for a sin of ignorance. That's what it means by an unknown sin or a sin of ignorance. There is no sin, there is no guilt for a sin of ignorance, but it's wrong. And when someone tells you and you are aware and your heart is convicted, then it becomes guilt and you bring an offering. That's how the sin of ignorance works. All right. Uh, a couple comments. One in reference to Eve at the tree. If she would have made any attempt for help from God, mm. all of heaven would you come bet. to her. 
You bet. No problems asked. But because of free choice, God could not step in until he sees she's given some indication she wants some help. That's right. Some indication. It wouldn't even have to be a word, a gesture, a thought, a feeling. He'd be right there. Right. Okay, then the other comment. Um, you were saying, you know, that uh, close of probation, God sealed the people. And then he says, okay, now it's time for Satan to give his best mm -hmm. and for God, you know, to show. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, so I'm picking on you. Okay. Your favorite text says that uh, God will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but he is going to make a way of escape. Mm -hmm. Satan says, hey, that's not fair. Mm -hmm. You're not allowing me to give my best sales pitch mm -hmm. to whip them. Right. God says, okay, with 144,000, you got the whole field. Mm -hmm. But he even gives a stipulation there, you can't take their lives. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't Satan like to take a few lives to make his case even stronger? Yeah. So your question is, um, is that really God playing fair? Is he playing a level playing field on this one? Where, where, right. where are you thinking? All right. We have to remember that this whole issue that we're dealing with is a jury trial. A legitimate real jury trial. God has turned over to every being he has ever created in his universe the right to decide who's telling the truth. God or Satan. This is not about you and me, folks. This is about the universe. I think there is a, uh, what was the name of that? Uh, theater, of the theater of the Universe that used to be popular. Mm -hmm. This is a theater of the universe. That the universe is deciding who's telling the truth here. Because they don't have the problem on their planet that we have on our planet. They can sit back in disinterested observance. They have a tree on their planet that they've never gone to. A tree of knowledge of good and evil, Ellen White says. And since they have never gone to that tree, they can now observe what that tree has done to this planet. And they can see what God has promised and what Satan has done. And is God can God really carry out his promises, etc. So it's really not about what Satan thinks. It's about what the jury decides. Satan is the prosecutor. Christ is the defense attorney. And the universe will make the decision. So although Satan may cry, Foul, you didn't let me kill them. God will say, that would ruin the test. And I think that the jury would agree with me. Jesus Christ will say you can do everything else to them. You can make them miserable. You can cause them to suffer. You will just do everything you can to them. But if you took your life, that would make the test invalid. Jury, do you agree? That's what is really happening in my best judgment. The jury will decide this, not say it. Satan will use every argument, fair or unfair, as lawyers do today, to make the point that they want to make. And only the jury makes the final decision. That's how I would respond to that. Okay, yes? This is along the same line, but I've been dialoguing with uh, a quite well-known speaker in the Adventist Church. But um, the, the issue right now is they're arguing that you can't, how do you reconcile the God of the Old Testament mm. with the non-violent God? Of Aren't the we Old back to that? Oh, back. Yeah, it's it's. Yeah, mm. And I taught a whole class in college on that point. What? <laughs> well, I, I like to hear because I, I'm dialoguing with him on this one. And uh, but anyway, the, his thing is he he said you don't really get it, and I, I don't have a problem with the God of the Old Testament because I know it's Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and I understand that whatever he did had to be done in love. Mm -hmm. I also quoted Patriots and Prophets, mm -hmm. different statements where the, 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 uh, at the rebellion when, when Moses came down to Sinai, mm -hmm. they killed 3,000 people. Mm -hmm. And God is the sovereign of the, of the universe, mm -hmm. and it's his right to make sure he controls the rebellion. Mm -hmm. And that 3,000 had to die mm -hmm. so that millions would survive. That's right. Uh, in fact, she points out that had those men lived, mm -hmm. the world would have gotten the condition worse than the flood. By sparing Cain. Yes. Yes. He, he brushed all that all aside. He says, "Yeah, yeah, but you don't get it." He said, um, "Jesus in the New Testament, nonviolence. You know, you don't stone Sabbath breakers. You don't kill adulterers. You know, blah blah blah." But in the Old Testament, you have God doing the same thing. He said, "He said, I don't even, I don't know the answer to the question, but obviously you don't understand that there's a problem." <laughs> <laughs> there's a problem, but it's an answerable problem. Yeah. Uh, the first point is to make very clear that the God of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ. That has to be done. If that isn't done, we're not going anywhere. 
So you have to go to those texts which show exactly that when I am the first and the last in Revelation is the same I am the first and the last in Isaiah. That those are the same beings. And it, it takes a study to go through the Jesus Christ references in the Old Testament under a different name. Uh, in, in fact, you know, when it says in Isaiah 9, 6, the great Messiah uh, com composition, that he, Christ, this one who is to come, is the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Christ is the everlasting Father. It says that. So these roles are very interchangeable in the Old Testament. And Ellen White says Christ is the one who spoke the Ten Commandments. Christ's finger wrote the Ten Commandments. So everything that Jesus is in the New Testament, Christ Jesus is in the Old Testament. That has to be laid down as a platform. He hasn't admitted that. I know. And without that admission, you're going nowhere. So that has to be the first point of agreement, that the Christ of the New Testament is the same as the Old Testament. Once there, then we can deal with the problem of the Old Testament violence. Now, here's, how I, here's what I did in my class. My assignment was that the students would find every instance of God's graciousness, God's love, God's mercy, God's saving, God's help, and God's redemption in the Old Testament. Find all the statements there are of love, mercy, grace, and power. Then in the New Testament, find all the statements that show God's destruction, God's penalties, God's hard, uh, as Ellen White calls it, his strange act, the Bible calls it that, and all of the things that are kind of ruthless and end of chances. In the, Ana in the New Testament. In the New Testament. Ananias and Sapphira. Um, Jesus says to fear not him who is able to destroy the body, but to destroy both soul and body in hell. Fear him. And he means, in that sense, be afraid. Uh, and in the whole book of Revelation, you have Christ carrying the sword. You have the, the, the wicked being laid out as carcasses for the eagles, the vultures to feed on. And you have all of this final destruction of the wicked in the fires of hell. You have all of that in the book of Revelation. You have various instances in Christ's life where uh, he turn, when, the, when the rich young ruler turns away from him, uh, it, apparently there's no, no redemption for him that we read about in the rest of the Bible, and it's done. The, the, the man who builds his houses stronger and is destroyed in the night, you know, Jesus uses those parables all quite, quite regularly. So I, that was my assignment. The fig tree is an example. The fig tree. And so to find all the examples where destruction is the same quality as it was in the Old Testament. Predictions of vengeance are the same in both Old and New Testament. Where there is not as much violence, we will agree to that. But there are clear indications that the Jesus of the New Testament is the same quality of being as the Jehovah of the Old Testament. So that was the assignment I asked them to do. To try to get this picture away from the hard God and the soft God. They are one God throughout both Old and New. In the New Testament, more is expressed of the love of God uh, in genuine ways through Jesus Christ than ever before seen. But it's there in the Old Testament. It's there for anyone who wants to read it. And in the New Testament, vengeance is still there. The wrath of God is still there. But again, the first point, same being in both Testaments. Without that, you're going to get nowhere. Okay, are we done? One more. Okay, one more here. A comment to what he said about okay. God. He will provide us with a route of escape and an yes. alternative. That doesn't mean that that window or that door to escape isn't filled with fear. Uh -huh. You have to go through it with faith that it is going to be all right. Because it, it is scary to run or, away or to escape. Yeah. I mean, there's still that fear there that you have to have faith to go That's through. That's right. There is a valley of the shadow of death that it's hard to walk through. Yeah. Last point. Yeah, okay. I think there's a quote, and I, I, I might not have this exactly right, but I think Ellen White says we shouldn't be so concerned about who the 144,000 are because yes. soon we will know who they are. That's right. That's what she says. Okay, now, this is the thought that, okay, Jesus went through a lot of stress under his temptation knowing that if he failed, the whole universe goes yeah. down. But I believe the 144,000 are going to go through a similar stress because they know that if they fail, mm -hmm. the plan of salvation goes down, same. Yep, I agree with you 100%.
Um, what we're going to go through as we go through the final stages in the plagues, if we're in jail or hiding in the mountains or whatever we are, we're going to go through the experience that Jacob struggled through during that night of wrestling. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And uh, Ellen White says, God will seem to us as an avenging enemy that has now come to attack us in spite of our decisions. Um, we are, Ellen White says that we are not going to be worried about what happens to us. Our fear will be that we will dishonor God's name. Amen. And that we will cause the destruction of his plan. Uh, she also says in another place that the scapegoat, when he is led away into the wilderness by the hand of a fit man, makes a mighty struggle to escape. And you know what that mighty struggle is? He had one of us to sin. That's his struggle of escape. If he gets one of us to sin, he escapes. He is not led over the precipice to destruction. And so that is going to be my fear. I know that going into this whole situation, that I will not hold on to that rope that binds Satan to Jesus Christ, that I will let loose of it and let Satan escape. And that will be my fear. Whether I get saved or lost, I'm not going to be worried about it at that point. I don't think honestly. I am going to be scared to death that I will destroy God's plan. And that will drive me to my knees constantly. Yes? I read the end of the book. We win. We win. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it is 10 minutes after 6. 11 minutes. Time for a little light uh, lunch, supper if you want it. Otherwise, a nice walk will do some good. And at 7 o'clock comes the dessert, the frosting on the cake. The end of the day in which we can kind of sit back, enjoy the beauties of God's nature, learn something new about God that we never knew before, and go forth with greater courage for the coming week. So we'll see you at 7 o'clock.